My name is Russell Green. At dawn on the morning of June 14th of this year, I set off in a rented boat to a spot 11 miles north of Oymer on Russia's Lake Baikal. My destination was informally called the Pit of Night. Three years ago, a giant sinkhole formed spontaneously at that spot, 3,500 feet below the lake surface, making the lake even deeper in that area. The pit of night, less than a half mile across, could only be detected remotely as it formed. Seen on computers as a nebulous disturbance, it took experts months to define. Geologists thought the sinkhole may have been set off by deep drilling on the shore near Popova during construction of a plant that would make cardboard, but they couldn't be certain. Also unknown was the exact depth of the pit of night, because divers, of course, weren't able to plummet to any extent. The water pressure became unendurable at only a thousand feet. Echo sounders, combined with the colder water temperature in that area, pointed to the possibility that the sinkhole was of a depth that may have made the spot match the deepest point of the deepest lake in the world, which is Lake Baikal itself. That would mean the bottom point was more than 5,000 feet below the surface. I had the idea to boat out to the pit of night as a way to unofficially end a three-week solo trip through Mongolia that I'd taken on assignment from the Tandem Region Times, based in Ontario. The idea was to drive in from my hotel in Irkutsk and go out to the spot and have a swim, just to say I did it, mark it on some interior bulletin board of minor outdoors accomplishments. I didn't think there would be anything out there of interest to readers, really. The rental service uh, must have been overly impressed with my ties to the press, because they were willing to give me way more boat than I needed, for no extra money. A 70-foot former shrimper that had been converted into a research vessel and hadn't seen any action for a while. It was pretty decrepit, at least, which was what I was used to. The pit of night was a couple of miles beyond the furthest point of tourist travel on that part of the lake, so I expected to be all alone at that hour of the morning. It was just light when I set out. By the time I had to start thinking about seriously plotting my position, it was full dawn, but totally sunless and foggy. The horizon and the sky merged in a gray, ghostly haze, making it impossible to tell where one began and the other ended. The lake was calm, and it was just barely warm enough to have a brief swim in my thermally insulated wetsuit when I got to the right spot. I saw exactly one other boat as I went, a Viking five-star, owned by somebody rich, or one of the charter companies, most likely. It had been more than a year since the incident that had cemented the sinkhole's nickname. I'm talking, of course, about the disappearance of the Beer Beschler sisters, the German outdoor adventurers in their late 20s, who were as famous for their fashion model looks as their mountain climbing exploits. But above all else, they were experienced, intelligent explorers. They blogged about crossing the pit of night on their way northeast in late June of last year during a photography trip. And 16 hours after they embarked from Oymer, the search for their vessel began. Yet nothing was ever found, not bodies, not the boat, not the slightest sliver of wreckage. The Beer Beschler sisters had simply disappeared. That was all it took to create the beginnings of a legend about the pit of night and what it might be hiding. It was tough to forget the last picture they took together as they climbed aboard their boat and headed off, smiling at the camera. The likeliest scenario was that they'd gotten caught in a squall and the boat sank. Lake Baikal's sheer size made it incredibly difficult to pinpoint their route. There were whispers that an abduction was possible, a kidnapping, piracy, but no evidence had ever been found of this. It remained a mystery. Consulting my GPS, I closed in on the sinkhole right on my informal schedule. 
putting along quietly at ten knots, feeling more and more alone, though God knows that was a feeling I was completely used to, doing what I do for a living. Even I, though, have my own interior tears of solitude, and that murky, oppressive sky and the barren emptiness of Lake Baikal all around me depressed my mood. I found myself looking forward to the plane ride home. I'm not sure what time it was when I killed the boat's engine because I had arrived more or less on the pit's center point. Visually, of course, I saw nothing different from my vantage point. The lake looked just the same. I sat and put my wetsuit on and I snapped a couple of pictures of myself smiling. And then I dove over the side of the boat into the cold water. It was so cold, I I let out a little yelp going in, but I had experienced worse. I took a couple of leisurely laps around the boat, then I treaded water for a time. Then, for posterity, I closed my eyes and let myself simply sink, my arms over my head, descending into the deep, naturally, allowing myself the fantasy that I was actually floating down into the pit of night itself. Its gaping mouth was 3,500 feet below me, unseen. But at least I could say I gave it a chance to suck me in forever, to claim me. But it never did. Just a few seconds into my descent, I reached a state of zen-like calm, and I was able to feel an appreciation on an elemental level for where I was, the awesome natural scope of it. I opened my eyes, and I saw only darkness. I just about reached my dive limit and I was ready to stop myself and swim back up to the surface for a breath. When my legs began to be lifted gently by a push of water from beneath me, as if a current were coming from below, the water felt no warmer or colder. My legs went up, up, until I was horizontal in the dark and I could hear the low moan of a large body of water shifting, reorganizing. And I freaked out a little. Uh, I was frightened of what might happen to me depending on the size of that current. I began to swim upwards quickly, but the current became stronger than I, and it turned me completely over. I popped up above the surface in a bit of a panic, but I regained control again quickly. The surface of the lake was still calm. Only when I was comfortably treading water again did it become just a little choppier where I was. I was maybe 50 feet from the boat, and I swam toward it with some haste. There was no telling where that rush of water had gone to or how big it had been. The only other time in my life I'd felt something like that had been when I was swimming in the Sea of Cortez and a blue whale had passed me from below. That whale hadn't been more than ten feet from me. But there was nothing that size in Lake Baikal, which was strictly a freshwater lake despite its 12,000 square mile size. I'd read that the creation of the sinkhole may have created powerful vents, but I'd never read any accounts of them. The old fishing boat rocked very gently as I got hold of the ladder hooked over its port side and I climbed back up. I turned and looked at the spot I'd swam from. There was nothing there of any note. I'd had my adventure, and after I changed out of my wetsuit, I'd head back to shore. I wondered if the Beer Bachelor sisters had maybe encountered the results of event, as some believed, and how strong it might have been. But even if they had, that might have merely wrecked their boat, but it wouldn't have swallowed it, unless whirlpools could be created over the pit of night. I'd heard of phenomena like that. I entered the open cabin, changed out of my wetsuit and into a sweatshirt and jeans. I stayed in my bare feet. I took two more pictures, both of the dreary gray horizon. Visibility remained very poor. It was a little unsettling not to be able to pinpoint where the horizon truly began because of the blurred focus effect the humidity was causing out there. At the point where the surface of the lake disappeared into nothingness so far out, I could see a slight disturbance. Very small waves were forming now, rolling in toward me. The kind of waves generated by a large craft, but I saw and heard nothing out there. 
it was more likely that the weather was not quite what I thought it would be. I'd had absolutely no indication that there would be the slightest meteorological disturbance in the area of the pit. The forecast had been for no sun, but certainly nothing above two on the Beaufort wind scale, no precipitation. But the climate could be strange, and it was best that I was leaving now. The boat began to rock gently. The waves seemed to double in size very quickly, but still no hint of wind. I thought something beyond the horizon was creating those waves. I was momentarily unbalanced as the lake's icy water slapped against the boat. Looking east and west, I saw that this was a very localized disturbance. The surface was strangely calm, only a hundred yards away. I moved into the cabin to be more secure. I would start the engine as soon as the boat was stable. I peered through the port side window, stabilizing myself against a ledge in front of me. The waves were getting smaller already, and the surface of the water was settling. I emerged from the cabin, closed my eyes, and listened. No engines, no horns, just the low hush of the black water. Then came a sound I've tried to describe many times, and I've always felt that I failed to. I've heard many sounds of whales as recorded deep under the surface of the ocean, and this was like someone had slowed a recording of that and deepened its pitch. It rose from nothing, just barely audible, and it demanded that I remain perfectly still and focus to hear it throughout its duration. It reached a sustained moan that seemed to come from behind dozens of unseen stone doors separated by miles of lightless, watery deep. Fifteen, twenty seconds, and then gone, dissipating like mist, in every direction and no direction. Though I was sure the source was far beneath me, not out there somewhere on the lake. No creature in these waters could have ever made a sound that full, that echoing, and I had the terrifying thought that maybe that was what the sinkhole's creation had sounded like, thousands of feet below the waves, and there had now been another destabilization which was opening it even further, creating a suction that might take me down forever. By now the boat had drifted to a point I guessed was on the southern edge of the pit of night. I started the engine and it kicked grudgingly into life. I had the presence of mind to cue up my smartphone's voice recorder, just in case that sound came again, though I might not even hear it now over the sound of the engine. I turned the boat toward the south, swinging around in an arc wider than I needed, so I could get a better look at my surroundings. But every direction looked the same. I had to rely on the GPS to point myself in the right direction. So paranoid had I become that I cross-checked its hint with the compass on my key ring. I headed back slowly because I didn't want the sound of an overworked engine to blot out everything else. I was content to put along that way for a while, replaying that sound I'd heard in my mind again and again. It was truly not different enough from things I'd heard in nature in my years of traveling to be something to be feared, but... I feared it all the same. I turned and I looked behind the boat, and and I couldn't stop myself from imagining a brief glimpse of the beer Beschler sisters standing near the stern. The color leached from their skin by days and days beneath the lake. Their location missed again and again by hopeless rescue vessels. I snapped myself out of that quickly. I focused on the tiny GPS display so I wouldn't have to think so much. And when I was about a mile past the pit of night, I opened up the engine more to get up to a speed I felt better about. For about five minutes, I plowed forward, hearing nothing over the engine, feeling a humid breeze created entirely by my motion. Occasional raindrops struck the window in front of me, nothing to worry about. The way ahead was foggy and unclear, but that didn't really matter now. My only concern 15 minutes from now would be some boat emerging too quickly up ahead. I'd estimate that I had my attention totally forward for a total of eight minutes before I turned around that second time to look back. Maybe I'd sensed something, but I certainly hadn't heard it. About 150 yards behind me, just at the point where visibility became washed out, 
Some enormous thing was disappearing beneath the waves. When I turned, it had been in the act of descending so that I only saw the end of its rapid motion, and I wasn't able to accurately judge the size of what I'd seen. I could only see that it had been a dark gray mass, jagged and contoured as if a gigantic rock had poked up from below and then swiftly vanished again in reaction outside forces. Maybe 15 feet of it had protruded, and for no more than a couple of seconds. From the point where it sank under the waves, white caps rolled outwards, fairly big ones. Whatever had gone below had gone below hard, and it was big enough to create a tidal shock wave a little bigger than the one I'd experienced before. I killed the motor at once without thinking, compelled to move toward the stern to get even a few feet closer to the site. As the boat drifted, the disturbance created by the thing 150 yards away settled fast, leaving just emptiness. That could only have been a whale, I thought to myself, which was impossible. They couldn't have come from a saltwater source to Lake Baikal. And it just seemed like it had been too big. The white caps it made too prominent. I took my camera out and I pointed it at that bleak horizon and I waited. If nothing happened in 30 seconds, I would retreat and get the boat moving forward again, slowly maybe, on the off chance that I could snap a photo of some amazing phenomenon. The seconds ticked away. The water stayed undisturbed, the last of the real waves passing the boat. My eyes darted from spot to spot, searching for any irregularity on the surface of the lake. Come on, I thought, come on, come on, what were you? The boat was rocking just a little more than normal. The water around it on all sides choppier than it had been. Then there was a terrific jolt that threw me off balance, almost as if I had struck a sandbar. And the boat's very gentle forward motion simply stopped. It wasn't moving at all, suddenly out here miles from the nearest landmass. I was freakishly anchored, held by something that wasn't letting me go forward, back, or sideways. My heart was hammering. The thought of sending a distress signal rose immediately in my mind as I tried to imagine what had gripped the boat. I edged close to the starboard side, keeping my center of gravity very low in case of another jolt. And I looked over. The lake was infuriatingly murky. As if to mock me, a single gull appeared from the east and settled on the stern, its tiny eyes seeming to fix right on me. Water suddenly flew up from just beyond the stern in an erupting spray, and a giant, pale, hook-like object the size of a man whipped from beneath the surface of the water and curled over the edge of the boat. That gull disappeared under its bulk. The hook thing smashed into the planks and drove deep into them, snapping them clean. And as it withdrew, it ripped the boards with it and it crashed through wood, fiberglass, and steel, smashing a gap there, pieces of the boat splintering and flying into the lake. The entire boat tilted upwards and I grabbed the railing beside me to hold on. The visibly organic thing went below again after scraping a massive section of the stern away in a second and a half, and the boat settled uneasily, rocking left and right. I remember just standing there for a moment, balancing myself, inert, numb with the kind of shock people must feel after seeing a car accident or... or being told their wife had suddenly died somewhere far away. Then my reflexes sent me back into the cabin to gun the engine even before I could survey just how bad the damage was. My only thought was to get away as fast as I could. As soon as the motor was going and the boat was moving forward, I stepped away from the wheel and I saw that I was not going to make it back to shore. The bow of the boat was angled now, dangerously high, and it was cantering to the left because of the imbalance created by the damage. Water was lapping freely over the stern and sloshing into the crater left by the hook thing more and more every second, the water weighing the back down, making it too heavy. 
I would eventually turn over, I thought. It was only a matter of time, so I pushed the engine hard, unable to keep the boat on a straight line, having to turn it against the momentum that imbalance was generating. The engine would blow out first, probably, destroyed by the lake water. The radio was in perfect working order. With the touch of one button, I sent my GPS coordinates to the Russian border guard. But locating an open channel through a gauntlet of static was the problem. There was a life jacket beside my head, and I tore it free from its hook, and I got it on as I frantically tried to stabilize both the boat and myself. I was never able to connect to a live person in the border guard before I had to abandon the radio. My coordinates and my cry of mayday would have to be enough. My attention was divided evenly between the way ahead and the way behind. Nothing was chasing me except time. It became difficult to even stand because the bow was cantering upward more and more. And this is it, I thought. I'm going down into the lake. There was a horrible industrial choking sound as the engine gave. That ended in terrifying silence. The boat carried forward with whatever momentum it had left, veering off to the east, getting me not much further toward the invisible shore. There was no point in waiting for it to go down. The incline would soon be too great for me to stay upright at all. I made my way out of the cabin in quick, small maneuvers, hanging on to whatever I could. There was no time to get my wetsuit on. Fearing I was going to my death, I leapt over the side of the boat into the frigid water, and I watched... The boat drifts pathetically on, leaving splinters and shards and debris behind it. As I tread water, it got closer and closer to the disappearing point in the gray shroud all around me, and then moved into it just as it began to turn over onto its port side. And so I never saw it go fully down. It became a ghost, and then it was gone. I tried to get my breathing under control so as not to go into total shock. I tilted my head to the sky because the blankness up there allowed me to focus on staying calm. My only hope would be to stay sane and swim, but it would take me another two full minutes for my brain to send me the proper signal to really move. Panic had me completely. And now, to my utter horror, my sense of direction had been destroyed. All directions still looked the same under that sky. I tried to visualize the path of the boat before and after it had been struck, but I was unable to calculate anything clearly. My course, useless as it would be, would be a guess, probably not even improving my chances of discovery by another boat or a rescue vessel by one percent. And so I chose to just swim away from where I believed that Weirdly organic, seeming hook had emerged from the waves. I wasn't more than 30 desperate yards on my hopeless journey when I heard the boat being struck far beyond the fog. Struck just once. Hard. A low crack as if it were being split in two. An echo trailed it. After that first Brutal contact. Whatever had smashed into it did not initiate contact with it again. When I heard that, I let myself drift. I am ashamed at how that broke my spirit, ashamed that my survival mechanism withered so fast. The part of my brain that should have been telling me to think rationally instead told me that there was something in the lake that would find me soon enough. Or hypothermia would claim me in another couple of hours. There was no cause to struggle. My chances were as good letting myself go limp as they were fighting to cover meaningless yards. Years ago, I was taught a trick by a man who had almost died in a snowstorm on K2. A trick to remain on an even mental plane in the face of hopelessness. When there's nothing you can do but wait for help, he told me. Blot out the visual. Close your eyes and keep them closed. Simplify. Become inert and sightless. And now I could feel that helping me. It was true. Processing the visual all around me confused my options and promised only a terrible end. 
and it had to be stopped, so I stopped it. I became brutally pragmatic. Sight would not help me in this moment. It would only cause me to overreact, to panic. If I could have kept all sound out, too, I would have. I heard water moving in a new way somewhere in front of me, very close. It was being displaced by something tremendous, and I was pushed slowly backward by a sudden current, still limp. It sounded like a waterfall was being born from nothing, and I began to feel spatters of water strike my face from above. My eyes were locked shut, but I sensed the daylight on my face being eclipsed, and the color inside my eyes went from a swamp-like gray to absolute black. As the sound of something mute rising from the lake continued, the spatters became a torrent. Water was descending off this gigantic thing high above me, cascading off it, and I was struck so hard by its force and volume I went momentarily under, then bobbed back up again as the shower tapered off, and I drifted further away from the center point of the great disturbance, sent away by the current. My face to the sky, I clapped my hands over my eyes, relying on my life jacket to just barely keep me afloat. I absolutely would not look. A cracking sound came from above, maybe as far as a hundred feet above. Something splintering. There was a splash off to my left, then one well behind me. And upon the third one, I felt an object strike my right foot, and there was a brief burst of pain. I had so profoundly taken leave of my senses that I didn't realize then that what I was feeling was debris from the boat crashing into the lake. Whatever it was that was towering above me became motionless. If it moved toward me, I would die, perhaps, but I would not look at my killer. Yet there was no motion, as if the thing were waiting for something, or maybe observing me. I took my hands away from my eyes, and that intense interior darkness beneath the lids remained. The thing was still there somewhere, blotting out the ghastly sky. It returned to the underneath all at once. There was a baritone whooshing sound, and then an immense slap against the surface. Water sprayed across me, and then waves engulfed me and set me turning over and over. My arms flailed, and I tried to stay up, but I became helpless. Lost in the rush of tide, the thing's descent had created. I felt myself drowning, spinning in the darkness, frozen, engulfed by my tomb, frigid, indifferent, lake by call the biggest, deepest lake in the world. I did not wish to return to the surface again. Here, down below where everything was and would be mercifully black forever, I finally opened my eyes as my body rotated gently, having no idea whether I was upside down or sideways or even still in one piece. A face emerged Ten yards in front of me, floating forward just a few inches from a point of nothingness. A face unnaturally, impossibly vivid under the water, and with it the rest of a body purely white in perfect contrast to the darkness. The figure of a woman, but this was no corpse. Like a sculpture made of white soap, the woman, once visible, remained perfectly still like she was standing on an invisible pane of glass, not floating, just standing there. Her hair stayed limp on her shoulders, and where her eyes had been, where her mouth had been, there was just white smoothness. She was holding something in her pale, bony right hand. It was a camera. Then she retreated into the dark, without her limbs moving an inch as if an unseen rope around her waist were retracting, retracting. Gone back to heaven or hell or the corridors of my subconscious. 
Why not both of the sisters? Why just one of them? Why had it been Yova, who they called the Shy One, the one long tormented by dreams and fears of dying in a plane crash? I next remember gasping uncontrollably. I had popped up onto the surface, and I was coughing up water and blood, my lungs spasming painfully. The shock of my body's last desperate attempt to hold on to life forced my eyes open for good. I was looking directly up at the growing dot of a helicopter coming from the south. My mind and body too wrecked to even scream or raise my arm in a signal. I just watched it. At first I was convinced that tiny engine sound so far in the distance was moving away from me. But I was wrong. I was back in the exact same helicopter that rescued me, 11 hours later as it flew low and fast over the waves of Lake Baikal, now layered in the shadows of night. The searchlight, when they turned it on two miles shy of the pit of night, gave me discolored glimpses of the choppy, secretive surface. No one was talking as we went into a wide, low arc around the search site the dangerous cold wind making it hard for the pilot to keep us completely steady. Everyone's focus had become quite intense. It was only just and fitting that I would be the first one to lean forward, hard against the straps that secured me, and point and say, There. There. I see it. There it is. <laughs>